so let's have a prayer. God, we are grateful for uh, this group of friends. We're grateful for this study. We're grateful for um, our communities of faith. And uh, we ask that you would bless us today with wisdom and guidance as we wade through some of the lesser known books and yet some that are incredibly influential just the same. Help us to see how they can empower our lives to be more um, loving and gracious and to be more faithful followers of Jesus. We lift the prayer to you in his name and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All righty. So we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 4. So anything in this one that particularly jumped out to you guys? Is this the Noah's Ark one? Well, first well, Peter chapter four starts since Christ suffered, then you also with the same intention, right? Suffer so that you can live your earthly life no longer dominated by human desires, but by the will of God. Was there one that we skipped where Jesus goes down to uh to hell and preaches to the dead people in 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 Sheol or something. Was that in in chapter three? Did yeah. we already cover that? It's in chapter three. Well, did we sort of blow by that or or that that would have been that would have been technically on last week's agenda. <laughs> so. did, did, did we do that? And I just don't. Remember. I mean, that's kind of a heavy. Uh, that's a heavy passage. Do you remember Delphine? Did we? Uh, no, I don't think we did because I think after we were done, then I kind of looked back and I was like, oh, we didn't talk about that. All right. I guess if you want to go back, we have a bit of ground to cover tonight. So let's go ahead and jump in. So what's that all about? I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's, <laughs> that's a new right. a new thing. I mean, I, I don't know that any any place else that's really covered that way. I just think that's a. It's kind of an interesting, oh, by the way, it's kind of story. But you're like, wait a minute, that's just a, sort of a fundamental thing. Jesus goes and checks out. Uh, <laughs> he's got other things going on. It was it was that other in other books, and we just I don't remember it, or is this a one off about the whole going down to Jesus preaching to the dead people kind of thing? I just think it's kind of interesting. I just like wow. Well, it is. Um... I, somebody was saying that the word preached wasn't correct, but um, that my Bible says that he preached. He went to the preach to the spirits in prison. Oh, in prison. Well, that's what mine says. Well, is it? Is it? It says that's chapter nineteen. Right. He he put down. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. So that would be, you know, considering the concept of going to Sheol, right? Because mm -hmm. they, they're not going anywhere, that's for sure. So I guess you could say prison, I guess. And and who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently for them in the days of Noah. And so um, only a few were saved. Um, but that baptism, which was prefigured, now it saves you not as a removal of dirt from your body but as an appeal to god for a good conscience through the resurrection of christ and then see this is one of those places where i feel like um they put a chapter divide in there but really it keeps going into chapter four talking about christ suffered and then um so we should move away from earthly or, or fleshly desires but it goes on to say um let me find where it is. The suffering. Is it in that one? That's the Noah thing. It's it's in, in chapter three. There mm -hmm. we go. The end of three. In the end of three, yeah. I like that that okay. sort of metaphor of the flood of Noah's Ark is sort of the baptism of you know, humanity basically or something there. Right. But one of the things that maybe it's in the second Peter, 
it's all kind of in my brain right now and I can't find <laughs> it, you know, scrambled in there and I can't, but, 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 um, the author of Peter of the letters of Peter says, you know, some people are, I think it's in actually in second Peter where, where it says some people are complaining that the second coming isn't happening. You know, that that was all made up. It hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. You don't have to live your life in these, you know, godly ways because it doesn't matter. And so enticing people away. So that's a big thing oh. in second Peter and in Jude. And But then it goes on to say, you know, so it's not that it's not happening. It's that God is waiting for us patiently, waiting for us to like get our act together because God doesn't want to bring destruction on us. That God doesn't want to separate any any out. God wants all of humanity to come together in, in salvation. And so, and so that's what this is talking about, alluding to in chapter three, right? Is that we we still have all these desires to exalt ourselves in ways that are pleasing for humans, but we're lacking in exalting ourselves in ways that are pleasing to God. And um, and so uh, so even when Christ suffered and and died but was made alive in the spirit and is working to bring about the salvation for all humanity, not just the people that we know and love, right? For all humanity. Um, I was a powerful section there. Just just a lot going on. (laughs) Yes. And it also makes allusion back to Isaiah. Um, You remember um, from Handel's Messiah, All We Like Sheep Have Gone Astray? You remember that song? Mm -hmm. Hey, Robin, she's like, yeah, I do. Everybody else is like, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so in Handel's Messiah, this is to me, this is one of uh, really one of the famous pieces, but it's straight out of Isaiah. A lot of the stuff is straight out of Isaiah. And, uh, And here we read it again. In verse 25, for we were going astray like sheep, but now we have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of our souls. And then it goes on, so that Christ suffered. And so if we also follow that example, we will suffer in the flesh, but then we will be dead to sin, right? And so here's one of the things that um, I think is important to think about. Um, Suffering in the flesh. So um, let's think about who this author is talking to, right? This author is talking to probably Jewish Christians, um, possibly in the first century, um, like the later mid first century to the end of the first century, perhaps moving into the mid second century, but um, the authorship is not. It states who it is, but but references made in some of the letters the, uh, and uh, the topics make scholars believe it's probably talking about uh, probably talking about things that hadn't yet happened, and not in a prophetic way, right? Talking about people's experience when they haven't yet experienced it. But anyway, so um, when it talks about suffering in the flesh, it's talking about Jesus hanging on the cross, right? For Jesus suffered in the flesh, Christ suffered in the flesh. So it's also going to happen to you, right? This is what he's saying. And so when he's saying this, he's not talking about, you know, like I had a headache today, right? Or I have chronic sciatica pain or something like that. We suffer in the flesh. That's not what he's talking about, right? Jesus, Jesus had a headache. But when we talk about Jesus suffering in the flesh, we weren't talking about him having a headache one day right? Or he got blisters walking around barefoot. We're not talking about that. We're talking about his physical torture unto death on a cross, right? Mm-hmm. It says, you know, you will also suffer like this. It's not just talking about, you know, not complaining that, you know, my arthritis is kicking up today or something. It's not talking about that kind of suffering. It's talking to the people who are literally being thrown to the lions, right? For the entertainment of the rich people to throw these people. So it says, it's saying, you know, this happened to Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, it's probably going to happen to you. 
right? Because the order of the world hasn't changed so significantly. If if they're going to put together the one you follow, then, you know, if they're going to put that person to death by physical torture, they are probably going to do that to you as well. And if you make it through this, you're not going to go back to how you used to be, right? Because that would be for nothing, right? You, you face down the lions for what? Just to go back to your old way? No, you're dead to sin now. You are so dead with that, right? You, you know it. You know oh that you are so dead to sin now, right? And so for the rest of your earthly life, you're not gonna be dominated by that. You're gonna be really free. And one of the things that brings to my mind is um, story. And I think I've shared this with you guys before about um, the people who were being trained with Martin Luther King Jr. when they were getting ready to make their protests at the lunch counters or when they were getting ready to walk the bridges and things like that when they would practice they would practice nonviolence, and so they would sit there and people would harass them they had it you know, like they would train each other so they would take turns sitting like they're sitting at the lunch counter and, and other people saying rude things to them and and you know saying all the kinds of things that they're going to actually be facing when they practice so that they could practice you know, being in touch with the frustrations and the anger and the injustice and, and maintain peace. And so then this guy talked about that they went on a march after they'd been gone through this training, then they went on a march and sure enough, they, they came at him with dogs, with clubs, they beat them, they hauled him off to jail. But he said that night in the jail, we sang our songs of praise because we had lived through it. We had faced our biggest fears and we had prevailed. We were still alive. We didn't cave in. We didn't, you know, betray what we had been trained for. We didn't betray the cause. We stayed faithful and we prevailed. And so they were genuinely just filled with songs of praise. So they, in jail together, you know, acapella, they're singing their songs of praise because they have prevailed. I think that's what they're talking about. If you face down a lion and, you, and you're still alive to tell about it, you're not going back, right? You're gonna, you, you're gonna know the power of God in your life. You are a new person. You are dead to all that other stuff because you have found what really set you free, right? And that's what that guy was saying. We faced our fears. We were no longer bound by those fears. We felt so free, right? So that's the kind of thing we're talking here, not... Not you're going to get arthritis if you live old enough, right? That's not that's not what we're talking here. That's, that's talking about being so committed that you will also endure suffering, not because you just got old and you got arthritis, but you're going to endure suffering because you will be tortured by those who are trying to break you. And so, having been tortured and prevailed. You will not, you will be dead to sin. You will not want to go back. You will not want to be part of that. You are given a whole new freedom and a whole new vision on how to live life. I kind of yeah. run across an analogy with uh, getting back to the ark, one of my favorite stories. <laughs> uh, that Noah had to build the ark. He, I guess he built it for many years. He had, obviously had to build the ark before the rains came. And so the analogy that I ran across was that this, this is we're building an ark inside of ourselves essentially to uh store the things that are the most valuable uh in in our spiritual life so that when the rains come in other words when the the, the bad things from a physical life <laughs> present themselves we have stored up uh this reserve of these things to uh survive the the you know 40 days and 40 nights of of rain and pain and and you know all these things that uh, that are going to happen and so that uh, then, you know, this, this is, it's it's not unexpected. Like the, you were saying, the people training for these marches, uh, they're, they're building their ark. And so they're putting the things that are the most important to them, you know, in, inside that ark so that it'll be protected regardless of the storms and the rains and all the things that are happening on the outside there. So I think that, that they just sort of threw that analogy or that, that little story in there. And I kind of, you know, poked at that a little bit because whenever they do something specific like that in these stories sometimes there's a there's a little thread that you can kind of pull on and more stuff you know comes out there so mm -hmm. 
but yeah, anyway i like to think of it that way is the the arc is our right. is inside us <laughs> yeah. i like that a lot i like that image let's look at um first peter chapter four let's work at look at chapter uh, verses seven eight in there because this is part of what's what what you keep hearing especially in in the books like peter the end of all things is near okay so hold on to that thought the end of all things is near we'll be coming back to that in the coming chapters and books um and therefore be serious and discipline yourself for the sake of your prayers above all maintain constant love for one another for love co covers a multitude of sins. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Love covers a multitude of sins, right? Mm -hmm. How many people have said, oh yeah, first Peter chapter four, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what it was nope. like. We've heard that, nope. right? <laughs> We've heard it before, but we don't know where, right? So this is one of those moments lifted up, first Peter chapter four. I thought it was time heals all wounds, but that's maybe that's another phrase. <laughs> There, there's many phrases, aren't there? There's lots of, no shortage of axioms in our world. But uh, um, yeah, but but the concept being that that if you really love and care for somebody and uh, and they are human, somewhere along the line, they're going to say something hurtful or they're going to do something hurtful. Because, yeah, count on that. Yeah, that's... count on it because they're human, right? Mm -hmm. But if you genuinely yeah. love them, then you'll be able to overlook that, right? The love covers a multitude of sins. You just, you know, and, and when you have a, a reciprocal relationship, when you love them and and you just it covers sins, you also go, oh right, and they are doing that for me as well. <laughs> I mean, my husband doesn't have to do it much because I'm so close to perfect, but. You know, <laughs> right? We can vouch for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and he could tell you stories. So, <laughs> no, it's, but that, that idea that, you know, that, that's why we work at being in love, right? That's why we, why we, when we get frustrated, then we take it to God and we, we learn. Mm. When we do that, we learn how to be gracious with ourselves. We learn how to be gracious with each other. And and that allows us to stay together. So that 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 phrase that John Wesley talks about, um, we don't have to think alike to love alike, right? Like mm. we extend that grace. We extend that grace. The person doesn't understand us, and and but we love them, and so we're gonna we're gonna overlook that. If we're just gonna let that love, that grace cover cover those sins, and then works back the other way as well when we all work at it all right let's keep going on down so i, I feel like that next part the suffering as a christian that's really just the the wrap up of what we've been talking about for these last couple of chapters here And then go ahead and look at First Peter chapter five. That's got a famous uh, song in there. Okay. Uh, verse six. Yeah, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Did that? I had to go to YouTube and and play some of that. I was gonna say, did you get the earworm? <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think, uh, remember at the service, we did that Strathy song, and I kind of remember it, uh, uh, they used to come to the Bay Area from time to time, and, you know, kind of a revival meeting sort of thing that they would do, and they would do the humble yourself uh, in the sight of the Lord, and they would do it as a round, right. and so they'd get, you know, half the, the group, you know, to, to sing, or they'd get the men to sing or something, and then the women would, would sing part of it, you know, just a right. few notes off, so you'd have this kind of Frere Jacques, row, row, row your boat sort of thing. The whole room would be just full of this 
this phrase, humble yourself on the side of the Lord and then the woman's voice for he will lift you up. And yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I never knew where that came from. And I was going to say, and now you know. <laughs> First Peter chapter 5. First Peter is good for something. All right. Okay. And then the next part, the next one, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And there is a, a like a, 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 a praise chorus or a cares chorus. And it says, cast your cares on Jesus. He cares for you. And you, and it just cycles through that. And, you know, and then the soloists take it different places, but the, but the line just keeps repeating. And it's like a call to prayer that that particular piece is designed for a call to prayer, cast your cares on Jesus. He cares for you. A good reminder. So another song that comes from first Peter chapter five, Okay, let's go on to Second Peter. <clears throat> oh, this is really, this is a really important one in chapter one. Let's look at... Um, Let's look at verses four, five, six, seven, and eight. Four, five, six, seven, and eight. Who would like to read that for us? Okay, I can do. Oh, are you going, Adam? Not if you're going. <laughs> just we both at the same time went, okay i'll go um, sweetheart because i love you <laughs> we can split it <laughs> um thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, you know, I just have to say, I, I had actually underlined the five, six, seven part. Right. And then I realized, you remember, in Blatt, not this previous Sunday, the one before when we were doing the connection. Right. And as right. soon as I read that, it's like, oh, Pastor Jenna must have read ahead. <laughs> it right. just, it was beautiful. Right. How the spirit yeah. connects things, all the mm -hmm. dry bones. But what I wanted to lift up was um, like what I want to lift up is from a pastor's heart. So all, almost all congregations that I know are saying we're getting older. We have less people there. You know, there's there's the world just doesn't seem to want to know this or that. Right. But when you read this, you read this li this list of what to do. This is this is not a this is not a um, this is not like the fruits of the spirit, right? This is a list of of actually things to do. So you um, support your faith with goodness, right? And in that goodness, then you will gain knowledge, and that knowledge helps to empower you to self control. And that self-control then helps to empower you to endurance so you can keep on doing it, right? And each step along the way, right? It builds on each other. And then, so you get through seven and then it says, for if these things are yours 
and increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is one of the things when people talk about, they'll know you by your fruits, right? When people come, at almost every church I know has visitors drop by. Even very tiny churches have visitors drop by. And when the visitors come in, if they feel this, this love, this mutual affection, right? It, it, it produces godliness with mutual affection and love. If they feel being washed over them when they come in, right? Then it prevents you from it from being ineffective and unfruitful, right? It, it produces effects in the lives of others. It, it bears fruits in the lives of the community. It, it increases, right? And, and so I want people to take this seriously. When, they, when people say, you know, oh, if we had a new program or if we, you know, did, you know, if we hired a different staff person or it's, it's like what it is is about living this out because when people come into your church, um, you know, if it's a nice place, they go, oh, that's really good, right? Um, if it's a place that's filled with judgment against the new person or just ignoring them, you don't need to go to church to be ignored in this world. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're not going to come back, right? But if they come into a place where they genuinely are washed in, in love and affection, right? Where does that happen in this world? How many people in this world are struggling and hungering to be accepted? or who, just who they are. No strings attached, just, wow, that's amazing. You're amazing. You've had an amazing life. You know, I want to hear your story and, you know, and, and come and help me sort of thing. Just whatever, I'm pouring coffee. Can you help me or whatever? Just, you're welcomed right in. You're, you're seen as valuable. It produces effects, right? It, it uh, stops from being ineffective and unfruitful so it bears fruit and so all the new programs and the newfangled stuff and getting better tech all of that can help but what the root of it is is people have to experience the love of god when they come in by us being practiced practicing starting with that um, people tend to be clicky they they'll say hello how are you but and my name is Robin, but then I'm going to go over and sit with my friends who I always sit with. Right. And then Robin, how many places in this world, how many times have you ever thought, wow, I wish I could go into a clicky place where nobody acknowledges me. <laughs> right. This is not what anyone's looking for. How are we going to grow the church? But we, but, but to be continually challenging ourselves and producing that endurance and and being able to love people through that multitude of sins just to be that presence that's that's will bear the fruit that will bear the fruit maybe not right away in church membership but that will bear the fruit of making disciples of jesus christ and if you make disciples of jesus christ you will grow a church if you well, uh, try to grow uh, a church you might make disciples but if you make disciples you will grow a church. Mm -hmm. uh, a funny thing happened at the last service. Okay. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if you remember this or not. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, uh, who is the gal that, that I think she read the scripture. She's a really tall gal, taller than me. Yeah, uh, oh, oh, Kim, who gave a testimony. Kim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she asked the congregation of, uh, an interesting question. She said, how many people here are extroverts? It was like three. <laughs> I don't think it was that many, but uh, you know, I couldn't see everybody from where I was sitting. And how many people are introverts? And I was like, I'd swear it was about 80% of the country. And I, I raised my hand as loud as, as high as it could go. And so uh, that's, that's something you can't exactly ignore. I'm not saying it's an intractable problem. I'm just saying it's, um, yeah. That... Okay. But, but here's, some, so this is something I would challenge you on. So do we get to use the excuse I'm I'm a I'm an introvert and therefore people don't experience God's love through me? Well, like I said, I, it's not an intractable problem, but it's something that can't be you know it, it's not not a thing. <laughs> so, right, right. There, exactly. there, 
there have to be ways to work through that and exactly. it's not just going to happen so and that's one of the things that i hope that you guys have heard me say is that that each person has to be working on what works for them right when too many times they want the pastor to tell them and i say you know well i spend time <laughs> and fasting and then they're like oh that didn't work for me what she does doesn't work and consequently one i'm doing it wrong or two i'm just going to quit right it's like Okay, well, that didn't work for you because you were different from me. God made you different. So what does work for you, right? So the the the, the concept of uh, make every effort to support your faith with goodness. That was the starting place in verse five. Make every, what does that mean for you? How do you support your faith in goodness? What, what works for you might not work for me. What works for me probably won't work for you, but but it's there where it, we're still given that responsibility to figure it out. So that when people encounter us, they they encounter a qualitative difference between the lives of Christians and the lives of non-Christians. Because people can genuinely feel the peace that passes understanding when they encounter people. They can genuinely feel, you know, love palpitating <laughs> right from the from from a person when they encounter them. In the same and way that must have been how the early church grew. I mean, they they couldn't have just been fire and brimstone it. It must have been, you know, these meetings at people's houses where they literally could feel that there was a change happening inside them. I mean, the, the early church grew pretty fast. So right. th West there was some went out powerful into people. the fields into the poor people and he met with them and he brought them into the church. Anyone that was considered less than that's where he went out and preached. But not initially. Well, not no. Initially. <laughs> right? But he right? That's, realized, that's... you know, he had to go out there and get some people. But, but, okay, so let me just say just a word about that. Because you're right. You're right, Robin. Because he had, we celebrate Alders Gate Day, right? We celebrate April 24th, the day his heart was strangely warmed. And, um, and the thing was, is that, and that changed, that changed a lot of stuff when he, when he really realized that his own sins, that his sins had been forgiven, not just the abstract, but that his own personal sins, and it, and it allowed a measure of grace into his life and into his ministry that started mm -hmm. changing things and the movement started growing. But it was in April the following year when he went to Bristol in England, mm -hmm. uh, he was invited there by Charles. <laughs> right and yeah. to listen to Whitfield preach and he and what he wrote in his diary was I consented to be vile and to go listen to the word of God preached in the street because um we might have been talking about that this recently didn't we talk about the throwing your pearls before swine right right don't throw your pearls before well that's what that's what they were taught like this the word of God is sacred and holy. And just to take it out into the filthy streets that were used as sewers, you know, the gutters were not just gutters, they were the sewers, the open sewers running through the towns, you know, and, and just to take, it was just throwing your pearls before swine. You didn't do that. You only preached it in the, in the holy setting of the, the sanctuary of the church. And, but, but George Wilfield saw all these people who never had never heard the gospel because they didn't have time to go to church and they didn't have a different set of clothing to put on. They only had their one smelly set of clothing. Right. And so, but his heart was breaking. So he went out and he preached to them in the streets and they were just like, Oh my gosh, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's, and, and Whitfield said to his friend, Charles Wesley, I need help. There's just so many people who need to hear this and I need to be able to take time with them to mentor them and grow them in their faith. And I can't do it alone. And so Charles wrote to a bunch of people who all said, yeah, not so much, but John that, okay, I'll come. And George is like, oh, really? I mean, John was like, oh, really? First, because John and George didn't get along. They didn't like each other. But John was the only one who said he'd come. All the other ones that George liked didn't come, right? So, <laughs> so they're like, okay, come on, John, come on, let's go. And Charles was like, yeah, yeah, you come, you gotta watch this. You gotta. So then so he so he writes in his diary, I consented to be vile and go hear the word of God proclaimed in the streets. And so uh so he went out and he watched what was happening. He was like, you know, and he and he he says, and I saw the Holy Spirit pouring out upon them, right? 
And so then they write in his diary the next day it was Sunday. And um, they said, you know, John, you should go and preach in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And so he writes in his diary, I consented to be more vile. Right? <laughs> now he's not just going to watch. He's going to actually do it himself. He's going to preach. I consented to be, and this is when he said, I consented to be more vile and declare in the streets the mighty acts of salvation. Right? Like that, that was vile. That was like so disgusting to declare out in the streets, the mighty acts. But that, carrying that good news and that love to the people who never heard it, that's when it started. That feeling people who'd never known that they were loved are important, hearing that they mattered. They were the workers, the people that supported the rich people the right and the do we one, have that yeah. happening today where the workers support the rich people and rich people don't value them yeah well, nothing's changed <laughs> right and, and yeah. so and part of the work i mean part of the work of methodists is that we do interact with you know i mean i just got done with a community meal we had about 16 guests and about 16 people from the congregation came and sat and talked with people throughout the dinner and it was lovely and everybody had a, a, a wonderful time together right it's that making sure people know that they're loved and taken seriously and respected and it was a, a lovely meal together just but there's a lot of people that wouldn't do that and and even like in liberia when i go to liberia when i always like, like to say you know people here think that liberia is hugely conservative and in, in by our standards it is hugely conservative but by the standards of africa it is not and they said you know, they were telling me about how liberal they are, right? And they said, you know, when we go and we do trainings, we go into communities and we train women how to do these sewing projects. We teach them how to sew. We teach them how to use a, a machine if they have access to it. We teach them how to make different kinds of projects that they can then go and sell in the market to support themselves. And they said, and because we're Methodists, we train everybody. Mm -hmm. And and I was I looked at them a little strangely, and they're and they're like, you know, the other churches they only let they only let people from their church come. They will only train people from their church, but because we're Methodists, we don't do that. We train everyone. Yeah. So that making sure everybody feels the love and feels included and feels valuable and important. So you know we're humans and we practice it imperfectly, but that's what bring that's what changes. That's what brings the fruitfulness. And, and, you know, worrying about some of the things that take up so much time and attention and, and so much of our resources that doesn't actually help people think and experience that love of God. And doesn't help us build up the love and the grace of God in our own lives. It, that, that just brings that unfruitfulness and, you know, that, that the scripture is saying, you know, if you do these things, it will pre prevent you from being ineffective and unfruitful. And so that's the thing that churches, when they started dwindling, because what are we spending our time on? Is it the stuff that causes us to be effective and fruitful and bearing witness to God's love in the world? Or is it, are we more consumed with stuff that really doesn't help us grow in knowledge and self-control and endurance and godliness and affection? And, you know, where, where, where are we spending most of our time? Anyway, so from a pastor's heart, I just have to lift up those verses because, <laughs> because when people say we're not being effective, I'm like, well, let's look at how we prioritize our time and our use of resources. How is that actually getting used? Right. Well, I'm not sure exactly how this fits in, but I was just thinking people forget what they hear. They forget what they uh, see. Uh, they, they even forget, you know, their experiences, but they always remember the emotion. Right. They remember how you made them feel, right? And so maybe there's some kernel of, you know, that's that's uh that's a thing. <laughs> it is it is a thing. And that and I mean we know it in our own lives, right? We remember how somebody made you feel that there's so many people, again from a pastor's perspective, there's so many people that in a community that will come and talk to me and say, Oh yeah, this is my church. And I'll be thinking, I've been here five years. I've never seen you. <laughs> you know, I've never <laughs> even heard your name before. But they came to some event somewhere along the line and they felt God's love. 
And when a, when there's a family emergency, this is the pastor they come to and they say, you know, my mom's in the hospital. Can you come and pray? This is our church. Like, <laughs> well, I would certainly come and pray. But inside I'm thinking, this is your church. Who are you? <laughs> I've never <laughs> even heard of you. And then somewhere along the line, they'll share the story of, you know, they brought their kid to vacation Bible school and that kid had so much fun and they were in the, and their kid was a problem child and everybody, it, they had a great week and they just felt so loved and it, they always remembered how wonderful this church was. And this is our church. Like, we don't know. We don't know, but, you know, they remembered how we made them feel. Right. They might not know about all these other things that help produce endurance, but, <laughs> but they remember how we made them feel. And that's the first step, isn't it? That's the first step. All right, let's look at first Peter chapter two, because we're we need to keep moving, don't we? Oh, okay. Yes, two. You mean second, second Peter. Peter? Second Peter, I meant. Sorry, second Peter chapter two. Okay. So this we're going back into Noah. <laughs> hey. So you can't get away from that. Right. And and so part of this, now in 2 Peter chapter 2, this is this is part of why we go into Jude as well. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, in this middle part where it starts listing um, some of the events from of old, um, and some of them are things that we, we like, we read it and we go, what? What is that talking about? Um... Let's think of where it is. <laughs> is the microwave done? Microwave. Popcorn's done. <laughs> well, anyway, so specifically in the areas of, of chapter four of P Second Peter chapter two, verses four, five, six, seven, in that part, part of what it's making reference to is some of the stuff that's in Jude. And so the two books um, kind of are contemporary for each other. And scholars believe that the book of Jude was written before 2 Peter. But when they read the book of Jude, they think Jude it says it was written by Jude, Judas, Jude, the brother of James. And so both in the book of Matthew and in Mark, it references that Jesus had brothers James and Judas, right? Which would have been Jude. So they're like Judas was a was a popular name back then, up until it wasn't. <clears throat> right. So, so the question. So then the question <laughs> is, for the book of Jude, is was Jude written by the guy, the brother of James, who's also the brother of Jesus? Like he was like trying to be humble and not mention, you know, not name drop so grandly. Or is it a separate Jude and James? Because, yeah, they were common names. So we don't know because the person says it as if the readers are for sure going to know who, who he is. Well known to the readers, but to us, we're like, was there another brother you wanted to mention in there? Or, you know, and you're just being humble about it, a little modest or not so much. So we don't know. Well, but anyway, a lot of this seems to be kind of all in the family, you know. So right. you got uh, John the Baptist, who's the cousin. you know what the the cousin, and you know as you just said, we got Jude. We got uh, isn't isn't James the the pillar? Not the pillar, but he's an important you know one of the one of the top three, right? So well, the, he's a brother. James is the name of a brother of there, Jesus. There, there was Peter, James, and John, but those were the sons of Zebedee. And then, but there's a there's two places again, one in Mark and one in in Matthew, where they mention the names of Jesus's brothers, and James and Judas were two other brothers. Oh, okay. so there's two James. Hmm. Wow. Okay. I'm, man, I gotta but, write all this down. But not necessarily in the twelve. Not necessarily in the twelve. Right. There were twelve. Got it. There was his brothers. Right. So. Right. Right. So. Um, all right. Well, anyway. Because Judas, but Jesus the book of went from twelve to seventy guys <laughs> that were talking and doing his thing for God. Um, right. And, there, right. Yes. There's there because he sent out the seventy right in twos, but but there was also all the women, and those would be talking about the seventy would have been men. 
And then, but it does talk over and over again about the women who went, traveled with them, the women who paid for stuff out of their own monies. to The rich them. ladies, yep. Right. They don't get very much credit, even though Jesus kept trying to give them credit. They he did. They were, the, the stories were written down by men who tend to overlook, like, like when Jesus says, you know, when the woman breaks the nard, the ointment anoints his head, and they said he could have been sold. And he's, why are you, why are you saying these things about her? She's done a good thing for me. And from now on, everybody, every everybody will remember that she's done this good work for me. <laughs> and the and, name is. <laughs> and then it proceeds. Who was it? Yes, who was it? You know, his death and his burial. The oil is like a proceeding, right? To what's going to happen in in his life right yes it's it's so beautiful how they leave little clues in there for us to find about the the bat you know the oil the burial oil and um all the things that they do throughout the bible yes yes so, so in Jude, um, they, Jude has a similar section that you'll read tomorrow in the center of Jude. And the thing about it is, is that they, they, they look at Jude and they say, well, was this Jude, the brother of James, who was also the brother of Jesus, saying that the author of this book was, would have had to have been in the middle of the first century? Or is this a different Jude? Because a lot of the stuff that's in here making references as the stuff that started happening in the second century, which was the people saying the second coming isn't happening. Look how long it's been. It's not going to happen. Well, people wouldn't necessarily say that after five years or 10 years, right? But after a hundred years, people would be going, it's not happening. What are you talking about? It's, it's not, you don't need to do this anymore. And that's what the book of Jude is talking about, about mm -hmm. the people who are drawing people away saying the second coming is not it's not what they're telling you is. And, and so they're living in, in uh, inviting people to turn away from what the author of Jude believes is the true faith. So, so then looking at second Peter, which is where we were referencing stuff that's in the book of Jude, then saying, oh, is this Peter, Peter? Cause it says it's Simon Peter, but maybe it was like handed down from, and somebody finally wrote it down because they're bringing in stuff that didn't happen in Peter's lifetime, referencing a book that probably wasn't written, you know, it would be like somebody talking about, you know, the life of Shakespeare and, you know, I'm, my name is William Shakespeare and this is what I wanted to tell you. And just like Mark Twain says, blah, blah, blah. You'd be going, wait, Mark <laughs> Twain wasn't alive, right? So biblical scholars reading that, they're like going, Wait, wait is is this is this the Peter? You you're, is that actually Peter? Because you're talking about stuff that didn't happen yet. So so that's a little bit uh, how the two books, both books are the the authorship is questioned. Both books, it's their scholars are unclear of when they were written, who really wrote them. Um, kind of even a little bit of question about who they were written to. Um, mm. so all of those questions that help us interpret the original meaning and then see how that can apply to our lives today, all of that's a little bit up in the air still, but still there's some good points that we can take away. Um, one of the things in second Peter and also in Jude, some of the stuff that people talk about, like, um, depravity and licentiousness and things like that. Um, I would, I would say that first and second century or yeah first and second century's concept of um licentiousness and uh such it wouldn't be the same as what we have today um our we are still hugely influenced in western culture by what the puritans decided was the definition of licentiousness right still hugely and and just to lift up just to lift up, you know, if I say to you, 
uh, do not commit adultery, what does that mean? We would all say, well, that means that, you know, when you're married, you stay faithful um, sexually and, and hopefully um, emotionally as well, but definitely sexually faithful to your spouse, right? Right. But do not commit adultery was a commandment given to a polygamous society. <laughs> they all had more than one one spouse, right? <laughs> sort of things like well, what does that actually mean then? Right? So we're, we're, our minds go one direction, but, but what does it, so when we say, when we hit, this is the definition of licentiousness, we can't say that that is what they meant back in the day in the first and second century. What did that actually mean? Those words. And so our modern concepts of licentiousness that may have nothing to do with what they were talking about. Right. Cause you know, they had to, if your husband died, you had to marry his brother. And then if his brother died, you had to marry the other brother. Right. And then Jesus, he tells you, well, hey, you're not married <laughs> to any of them. <laughs> right. Or, or, or the idea that if you don't give children or you don't give sons, you know, another wife, if your husband's rich enough, another wife is fine. That's not something we're okay with nowadays for the most part, not in our Western cultures anyway. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, the concept of having a mistress, which is essentially a, a fancy concubine, you know, that's well known, but, and that's well documented in our Bible, very well documented, lots of concubines in our Bible, you know? Yeah lots of concubines in our bible but it tends to be towards the man can pretty much do what he wants with how many women lots of misogyny the women in can't yes lots of misogyny which is where jesus wasn't where jesus kept lifting up women and the men kept ignoring them anyway right so interesting studies but anyway i just want to lift those things up it's almost time to bring it to an end today i just wanted to lift those things up so that as you're reading these you'll be thinking trying to trying to not just impose what our modern ideas of these words mean recognizing that probably how the modern understanding has been shaped is very different from what they were thinking about what they were meaning when they were writing those words yeah all right. Um, so anything before we go, or we're just about at our hour of Bible study, anything more that we want to lift up before we go? Mm -hmm. The closing of Second Peter, no, the closing of Jude, let's go to Jude, is a beautiful closing. I'm not a super fan of Jude, but I do like the closing <laughs> of the letter of Jude. The benediction? Yeah. Can you read that benediction for us? Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. 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 It's pretty heavy. Yeah, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>